So we started to look at online audiences uh, as a result of paying attention to our, our web metrics and analytics. Um, one of the choices we made in designing our website at the Indianapolis Museum of Art was to centralize um, the information architecture of the site regarding a physical visit to the museum under a, a particular area. So it made it fairly easy to segment the content access uh, of our web visitors by those visitors who ever see information that's uh, relevant for a physical visit uh, versus those visitors that never see information about physically visiting. So we did this little experiment where we just removed of every visitor who would have seen a piece of content that had anything to do with visiting the campus of the museum. And we were left with more than half of the visitors to our site were having an experience with content that was other than uh, what would drive them to visit the museum in Indianapolis. Um, we, when we were doing this, we had about a million uh, unique visitors in a year, so that meant that uh, somewhere around half a million of those visitors were having content-only experiences on the website, um, and that that number was uh, vastly larger than the physical attendance of the museum, almost by 50%, uh, but yet we knew very, very little about those visitors, um, what they were doing, whether they were being successful at what they were seeking to do, whether they felt like they had a good experience, uh, and not even to get into the depth of that experience. So museums have entire departments dedicated to the on-site experience for visitors, and almost no one is working in depth about how to create deep experiences for visitors on websites. So uh, I guess to extend this notion, it, it's, it's kind of hard to study, but it's, we're going to figure it out. But what would be amazing is to try to push the boundaries of engagement on the web with objects in our collection and to figure out exactly where that, that gap uh, in experience is. Um, I think I'm, I'm one who does not believe that the, the technical mediation of an object can ever replace uh, its experience in a physical gallery. Um, I think there is going to be that experience gap there where you can't transmit the aura, aura of that object uh, through the web, but I think we have experiences online that are deeply personal and meaningful, and uh, I think we'll begin to see museums that uh, provoke transforming engagement on their websites with visitors who might be thousands of miles away and, and never make it to the museum. Um, so there's going to be some interesting work in piecing apart um, information-seeking visitors versus experience-seeking visitors. And the two modalities of access are very different. For an information-seeker, you want to optimize their experience and make it very efficient. You want to make it very easy to answer their question. For the experience-seeker, I think you want a very aesthetic experience where you optimize the the beauty and the depth of that experience so you know the ultimate extension of this how do you uh, how do you do both of those things within the same site or how do you automatically funnel visitors into one of two camps based on uh, whether they're information seeking or experience seeking so I think that's very interesting but it's gonna take a while to get there uh, the web is very messy. Uh, I mean, studying web visitors is very is very messy, and uh, it approaches being as messy as the real museum. <laughs> it's probably not quite 
that. But uh, when I say messy, I mean that uh, real people come with a variety of motivations. They are not uh, a binary switch on or off. And, and in fact, when I say they are experience versus information seeking, that's really a spectrum and not a, not a bucket. Um, so the ability to span both of those uh, kinds of experiences is what's tricky, I think. Also, um, the sampling tools we have for the web are pretty crude right now. Uh, they kind of evolve to uh, forms and surveys at a certain point, which, which are not expressive enough to really get, especially at the underlying aesthetic experience. Um, that is kind of difficult, so, um, but there's lots of reasons to figure it out, so I'm, pr I'm pretty confident we'll be able to, to make some progress there. The, the issue of motivation and the differences that in-gallery visitors versus online visitors bring with them concerning their motivation uh, is a pretty interesting thing to study, and a lot of the research around in-gallery visitors has centered around their, their intrinsic reasons to come in the first place. And Falk in particular asserted that a lot of that has to do with their own uh, identity, uh, their own formulation of who they are and expressing that through visiting museums and other free choice learning spaces. So I don't know how much of that will hold online because so much of that has, is done in a, in a private setting and not as much of a public setting. So I think that intrinsic motivation still holds. I don't know how much identity formation would play a role in that or not. Um, that's really interesting to study. Um, I think um, in terms of predictive tools. Um, it seems like it would be possible to have a stochastic model of predicting a, uh, outcome or satisfaction based on uh, pay a path through a site, a, a path of pages through a site. But it may be, so that's interesting to study from an academic perspective. Is it possible to predict uh, from very a very pragmatic point of view, it may be enough to be explicit with the user about the kind of experiences you're trying to provide. So if you know you could build a model uh, of there are these kinds of motivations coming to your site and could you express to the visitor, we are intending to build tools that support you if you're looking for specific information uh, so then let the user choose within uh, a suite of, of tools that you might provide. So we could study the visitors we do have, try to segment them and break them down into the kinds of activities they're attempting to perform, build interfaces and tools that support those activities, and then explicitly say, if you're trying to do X, this is a great path to take. If you're trying to do Y, this other path might be better, and then allow them to bounce around. So if we do that, then the really interesting thing to study is what, what causes people to bounce between those channels, and what is it that converts a casual browser to a specific browser, uh, or someone who is coming for a research, answering a research question, who happens to get uh, completely distracted and spends hours of time in a really deeply aesthetic experience. So the switching the channels or crossing the streams uh, could be an interesting thing to study.